Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'udhu bihi wa natawakkalu 'alayh. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina. Man yahdillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu fala hadiya lahu. Wa nashhadu anna sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa maulana Muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu. Wa sallallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran kathira Amma ba'd fa'udhu billahi minash shaytuan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim In last week's lesson we made a start on the section of at'ima and ashriba in Islam the section regarding eating and drinking in Islam and I mentioned the physical and also the spiritual importance of eating halal. Earning halal, that's also very important as well, but that is like a, another topic. But also the physical importance of eating halal. Even modern medical research will tell you that the way we sacrifice the animal in Islam, that you sacrifice the animal then the blood gushes out of the animal, the infectious blood, the blood which may carry many diseases, many germs, many bacteria, it gushes out and then it is more safer, it, more lawful, more halal uh, to then consume the animal. <coughs> Whereas if you were to stun the animal and then consume that animal, or if you were to eat, say, for example, an animal which was not which naturally died, it wasn't Islamically slaughtered, and you consume the animal, then the blood which is inside the animal, which hasn't gushed out when it is Islamically slaughtered, but when it's stunned, the blood stays in the animal and it dies in that particular state, and you then start consuming the animal, then the blood which is sometimes very infectious, it carries a lot of germs, diseases, if you then consume that, then as medical research points out that is very harmful to a person he may then start developing various diseases inside him he may then carry various germs to the extent that depending on what kind of food he's eaten it could actually lead towards cancer as well so physically eating haram is bad and spiritually eating haram is also very bad as well as Mawlana Rashid Ahmad Gungoy Rahimullah one has once mentioned in one of his commentary, in one of his taqreed, that when somebody does something haram or eats haram, then the nur of iman extinguishes from his heart. As mentioned in the hadith, that when you do a sin, the nur of iman goes away. So similarly, when somebody eats haram, the nur of iman goes away from his heart. And even if you do toba, that nur of iman doesn't return unless you start then doing good actions and good deeds. And that's why there are many hadiths where Rasulullah has said that if you've done a sin, <coughs> but after the sin, commit a, a good deed, commit a good action. After you committed a sin, give sadqa, give charity. And the importance of doing a deed, a good deed after committing the sin is so that the nur of iman then starts burning in your heart again. Just doing tawbah, that is not sufficient. In particular, there's a hadith in Sunan Tirmizi where there was this Sahabi, he committed a sin. So he came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accepted his tawbah, accepted his repentance, but then said to him, go and look after your khala. Go and look after your maternal aunt. Rasulullah firstly asked him that, do you have a mother alive? He replied, no. Then Rasulullah asked him that, is your khala alive? Is your auntie alive? So he replied by saying yes. Then Rasulullah said that, go and do her khidmat. Because by doing her khidmat, you will get good deeds, you will get good actions. And by doing the good action, then inshallah the nur of iman will then start engulfing in your heart. And from this we can understand, as scholars have said, as mentioned in the hadith, that Al-Khalatu bi manzilatil um, which means that our maternal aunt, our mother's sister, our auntie, they are like our mothers. So the same way we treat our mothers, obviously our mother's parents, they have more respect, more right than our aunties, but 
The same way we love our aunties, we have affection for our aunties, we do the khidmat of our mother, the same thing, the same affection we should also have for our khala as well. So this is what we, another point which we can gather from the hadith. Now moving along to today's uh, lesson, to today's section, what I'm going to firstly do is just mention some adabs and some etiquettes with regards to eating, how we should eat, which hand should we eat, use when we eat, uh, for example, which fingers should we use when we eat, and these kind of adabs and these kind of etiquettes with regards to eating. And I'm going to explain these etiquettes and these adabs from the hadith book which we have in front of us, which is Sunan al-Tirmizi. So think of probably today's lesson to be more like a dars hadith rather than a fiqh lesson. And we shouldn't obviously think, oh, I've come here for fiqh, you know, why am I here for hadith for? Because remember, fiqh is derived from Quran and hadith. Many people nowadays think that fiqh is totally separate. That you've got Quran one branch, hadith one branch, and fiqh is a total separate branch. People think that Imam Abu Hanifa's opinions, Imam Malik's opinions, Imam Shafi's opinions, Imam Ahmed's opinions, these are all like their personal opinions and it's got nothing to do with Quran and Sunnah, Quran or Hadith. Okay, totally incorrect because whatever our four Imams have told us, it's all related or it's all linked to the Quran and Hadith. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, didn't say anything without evidence or proof from the Quran or Hadith. Imam Malik rahimullah did not say anything without evidence from Quran and Hadith and so on and so forth. So think of this to be obviously like a kind of a Hadith lesson, but also remembering that obviously the, the fiqh or what we're going to understand, they all are derived from Hadith. So it's not something strange what we are learning today. Now the first etiquette which I want to mention is <coughs> about eating with our right hands. So it is a sunnah. That when we eat, we should eat with our hands, we should eat with our fingers. And also it is a sunnah that we eat with our right hand. And there is a hadith which can be found where Rasulullah sallam said that none of you eat with your left hand because shaitan eats with his left hand. So when we eat, we should not eat with our left. Why? Because shaitan eats with the left hand. Because remember, Shaitan, he likes to do things where he's disobeying Allah, he's disobeying the Sunnah. So when the Sunnah and the order of Allah is that you should eat with your right hand, Shaitan will purposely do the total opposite. So when we are eating with our left hand, we are then imitating and following Shaitan. So therefore, the Hadith says that do not eat with your uh, left hand, but instead eat with your right hand. And then there was another, and then there's another hadith under this particular chapter where there was a person who was eating with his left hand. He was eating with his left hand. So Rasulullah said to him that eat with your right hand. So that person replied by saying, Oh, I can't do it. You get sometimes some people, some especially some youngsters, you tell them, or oh, sit down and eat. And they say, no, no, I can't sit down and eat. Or you tell them, or, you know, sit down and urinate. But they say, no, they, out of like, you could say more out of uh, takabur or other reason. They don't want to listen to you. They say, oh, I can't uh, sit down and urinate. I need to stand up and urinate. You know, they make these kind of excuses up. So this particular person, he said to the Prophet wasallam that I can't eat with my right hand. So then Rasulullah <coughs> replied by saying that you will never be able to eat with your right hand. In other words, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave a badwa that you will never be able to eat with your right hand again. And then the hadith goes on to say that that person, his right hand, his right arm became paralyzed and he was never able to use his right hand again. Now why, why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam make a badwa against this person? He made this badwa or curse against his person because he was not following the sunnah. He was rejecting the Sunnah. <coughs> he was doing eras of the Sunnah. So Rasulullah told him to eat with the right hand, which was the Sunnah. But he said, no, no, I can't do it. So what did Rasulullah say? That, okay, in that case, you'll never be able to do it. And that what then happened is that this person was never able to pick up his right hand again. 
So what we can understand, all these adabs and sunnahs which we're going to look at, some people think, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, you know, eating with left hand, right hand, or it doesn't matter eating on tables, or it doesn't matter, you know, whether we're using knife and fork or spoons, you know, just eat with uh, whatever we have. If we're doing it in a way where we are, uh, we are rejecting the sunnah, I'll explain it later about eating with knife and fork and spoons and so on, but... If we say, for example, don't want to use our fingers because we think of it to be or dirty or we think of it to be embarrassing or we think of it to be humiliating. Sometimes we get our Muslim brothers and sisters that in front of other people, whether they're non-Muslims or Muslims, they won't eat with their fingers. <clears throat> now, it's not because like, you know, the, the food which is in front of them is something which cannot be eaten with fingers. But what will they do is that they'll say that, no, it's humiliating for me to use my fingers. You'll get some people, even something like, say, you know, I don't know, like uh, something dry, like samosas or something. They'll, you know, they'll get a knife and fork and they'll like, cut it into pieces and they'll eat it then. So something dry food, even then, they won't, they'll, and the reason why is because, you know, it's humiliation. They think, oh, if I use my fingers, it look embarrassing. So if somebody was to do that or have that intention, then, you know, this is the situation that... You would be humiliated in this world and also you'll be humiliated in the hereafter. Because never underestimate <coughs> rejecting the sunnah of Rasulullah or rejecting the commands of Rasulullah. I'll give you an example of the Battle of Uhud where Rasulullah told those 50 companions to station around the Mount Uhud. And Rasulullah gave them clear instructions. That not to leave that spot unless I tell you. Even to the extent that as mentioned in some hadith that Rasulullah said that even if you see us being defeated, don't leave that spot. Even if you see us being victorious and collecting the beauty and the mani ghanimat, even then don't leave that spot. But what happened? Some of the uh, people, they left that spot. They thought that the battle had been won. They left that spot and then the Mushrikeen army who at that time was under the control or that particular flank of the army was under the control of Khalid bin Walid who hadn't converted to Islam at that time. He then came with his people and attacked the Muslims from the mountainside which led to many many Muslims attaining martyrdom and shahada. So now what happened there? It happened because of them not following the sunnah of Rasulullah so that is uh, one other than what an etiquette we can derive is the importance of eating with our fingers, with our right hand in particular. Which then takes us me on to the next other and the next etiquette where Rasulullah has mentioned that Iza akala ahadukum asabi'ahu, which means that when one of you eats, then after finishing eating, he should lick his fingers. Which is again another very important sunnah of eating. Now, one question here we need to look at is how many fingers, one point here is that how many fingers should we use when it comes to eating? Now, the sunnah is that one should use three fingers. The thumb, the index finger and the middle finger. So you should use these three fingers to eat. But in some hadiths, like in the hadith in Tabrani, it's mentioned that Rasulullah used five fingers to eat. Five. So from this, what we can derive is that certain foods where you need more fingers, in particular with chawal as well, with chawal, when eating chawal, sometimes it may be difficult to eat with three fingers. So if you were to use four fingers or even five, then that would be allowed. But those foods which don't require all five fingers, like I said, like picking up a samosa or kebab or something, then in that situation, you should, one should use three fingers because that was the, the continuous sunnah of Rasulullah Now, if you're eating, either you're eating with three fingers or you're eating with five fingers, when it comes to licking your fingers, <coughs> the sunnah is that one should lick from the little finger. So if you say, for example, use these three fingers to eat, then you should start licking from the middle finger, and then the index finger, and then the thumb. If somebody, as I was saying, was eating chawal, and he used five fingers, then again, you should start licking from the little finger, 
ring finger, middle, index, and the thumb. And what I mean by licking here, because the hadith lak, lak, or as we say in Urdu, chatna, means to put your finger into your mouth and then take it out. Not like, like this, you know, some people, like when they finish eating, they got some rice or something then and they lick it like that. So not that, but actually putting it into your mouth and then taking out and sucking it out. So that's what chatna, that's what laika uh, yalaku, that's what it means to put your fingers into your mouth and then uh, take out the uh, whatever food is stuck between your fingers, the salon or the grease, then to you take that, then that is the, the sunnah here. So that's the second point. Now the third adab and another etiquette of eating Rasulullah has mentioned is to make sure that we not only lick our fingers after eating, but we also lick our plate as well. That it's not just tick, it's not just restricted to the fingers, but also after finishing eating, we also lick our plate as well. Now, why why is it so important to lick our plate? There's two reasons. Number one, one reason is because only Allah subhanahu wa taala knows. But do you know the the rice or the grain? Just say if you're eating rice. So the grain which is left over in the plate, it could be so that the grain or the leftover chawal, there was barakat in that. There was baraka and barakat in that. So what you've done is that you've ate everything else, but that one or two bits of uh, rice at the bottom of the plate, on the side of the plate where, generally speaking, we just like pick it up and just throw it away. That one or two grains of chawal, they could have been baraka and blessing in that. So therefore, it's important that when we finish eating, we eat every single uh, grain of rice. If we're having chawal or if it's salan, then making sure that we have every single uh, syrup or every single bits of salan, we lick it, we finish it off. So that's one reason. And another reason, as mentioned in the hadith, is that those who lick their plates, who lick their plates, the plates would, inshallah, do istighfar for that person. So two reasons. Why? Because the leftover rice or chawal or the salad, there could be barakat in there. And the second reason why we should make sure that we lick the plate is so that uh, the plates, the qis'a, as mentioned in the hadith, they can do istighfar and they can seek forgiveness for that person. Now again, some of you may be thinking, how on earth this plate is going to do istighfar, you know, the, the plate which we have in the kitchen, how it's going to do istighfar then. Remember, as Allah says in the Quran, wa min shay'in illa yusabbihu bihamdi. Which basically means that every single thing do, does tasbih and does istighfar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every single, so obviously stones which we have, they do istighfar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Animals are also doing istighfar of Allah. The trees are doing istighfar of Allah. So everyone is doing istighfar of Allah. Similarly, the plates as well, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give, because obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all powerful, He can give kudrat and power to this plate to do istighfar for us. So these are two reasons why after we finish eating, we should also do, isti- uh, we should also lick the plate properly and make sure that uh, everything is finished. So that the two reasons I mentioned, because there could be barakah in the leftover food. And also another reason is so that the plate can do istighfar for us. Now, one of the beauty of Islam is that Islam is not just regarding uh, as I was saying last week as well, I probably touched on this. It's not just restricted to namaz, fasting, zakat and so on. But a lot of emphasis and aspects is given on the people around. Like in terms of not giving taklif and not giving izah to anyone. A lot of taqi, a lot of emphasis is placed on that. Not to hurt anyone. That's why, as you know, that when we go for hajj or umrah, when it comes to the black stone, kissing the black stone. Now, kissing the black stone is sunnah. But if it means by kissing the black stone, you are going to be giving <coughs> the cleave to someone, you leave out the sunnah. Halaki, I just mentioned five minutes ago the importance of following the sunnah. But if there's something, if, if by doing the sunnah, it means that you're going to be giving taklif to someone, 
you leave at the sunnah and you abstain from giving taklif to brothers or sisters so this is what islam emphasizes on the importance of you know togetherness ulfat muhabbat the importance of not giving taklif to brothers not giving taklif to sisters and keeping this in mind in Sunan al-Tirmizi itself, there's actually a hadith there, a chapter which the author has mentioned himself about the detestability or the karahiyat of consuming garlics or onions or any other of these kind of uh, fruits or vegetables which got a foul smell and then to eat those and then without cleaning your mouth, without doing miswak, then to come into the masjid and pray namaz Rasulullah has said that this is makru and this is dislike. Makru at tahrimi to the extent. Why? Because not only are you going to be giving taklif to the brothers who are in the masjid, but you will also be giving taklif to the angels who are with us. Okay, even these gatherings of uh, remembrance of Allah, dhikr of Quran or hadith or fiqh, you know, the angels are always present there. So when if somebody is coming to the masjid, and he's ate something foul like garlic or uh, uh, garlic or onions or if you want to do some modern day examples like smoking so he smoked just two three minutes before maghrib and then he comes in and he prays in the mask and the smell which he gives out or it could be anything it could be somebody working say like in, in a fish and chip shop and he's working there like two three hours non-stop you know uh, the oil the smell of the oil the smell of the the uh, the pakoras, the samosas and so on and then he comes into the masjid for Dhuhr prayer or for Asr prayer he is giving taklif to the brothers who are there and this unfortunately happens a lot in Ramadan in Ramadan as in all the, the pakora shops they make a lot of money so everyone's making pakoras so they're just making pakoras for hours and hours and hours and then when it's Asr time or Dhuhr time they'll come into the masjid and you can literally sm you know, smell the, you know, the pakora on that person or the samosa on that person so you're giving taklif to brothers. People don't realize this, but they think, oh, mashallah, we're doing good. That, you know, we making pakoras for the, uh, which is obviously, as mentioned in a hadith, that it's good to feed people, give iftar to people. You know, as mentioned in a hadith, that if you treat someone or give iftar to a brother, then the reward he gets for fasting, you will get the same reward as well. So it's very good to, you know, prepare iftar and so on. Nothing wrong with that, but you also, you know, be aware of the surrounding, what is around you. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that you know these kind of things, uh, you know onions or smoking or uh, you know consuming garlic and so on, if it's being consumed raw, and then somebody's coming into a masjid without brushing his teeth, without doing miswak, because he's going to be giving taklif to the brothers around him, then that is considered to be makru and that is considered to be dislike. So again, that is something which we one should uh, refrain from and one should abstain from. Just one final ruling before we finish, inshallah. Uh, another ruling here is with regards to making the or the importance. Sorry, should have actually mentioned it right at the beginning. Uh, regarding the importance of saying the dua or come se come saying Bismillah. Okay, so the importance of saying saying the dua before eating, and also the importance of saying the dua or praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after we finish eating now why should we say bismillah at the beginning it's again mentioned in the hadith that those who don't say bismillah and they eat firstly the barakat goes from there and also shaitan eats with them shaitan eats with them like as mentioned in another hadith that if somebody doesn't read the dua before intercourse with his wife then shaitan participates in that intercourse similarly when it comes to eating or drinking if we don't say bismillah then shaitan also eats with us as well and that's why we see people that they don't say bismillah and they eat so they eat one or two plates of salad but they still feel hungry so one reason could be because they haven't said bismillah because when you say Bismillah, then there's so much barakah, there's so much blessing that you'll only eat a bit and your stomach will be full. And generally speaking, any kind of uh, good deeds or good actions which we do, 
we should always say Bismillah before doing it. It's not just for eating or drinking, by the way. Anything, whether you know, we're working, whether we're doing a talk, whether we're doing a lecture, it's always good to start off with Bismillah Rahman Rahim and then Alhamd and then praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you look at it, the Quran was revealed with the name of Allah. Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khala. That recite in the name of the Lord. And that's what Bismillah Rahman Rahim means in the name of Allah, Ar Rahman, the most merciful, Ar Rahim, the most kind. So when it comes to eating, we should always read Bismillah. Come sick up. If, if we don't know the full dua, but at the very least, we should say Bismillah before eating. Which then takes me on to the next point is what is the dua? Now, I think many of us probably read Bismillahi wa ala barakatillah. I think that's the dua we tend to read. To tell the truth, that is not the correct pronunciation of the dua. It's actually Bismillahi wa barakatillah. There's no ala there. Because remember, the, whatever duas we read, it has to be established from hadith. And in the hadith of Mustadrak Hakim, the dua which is there is Bismillahi wa barakatillah. There's no ala ziyadati there. It's just Bismillahi wa barakatillah. So, uh, so that is a dua we should read Bismillah. As I said, if somebody just read Bismillah, then that would also be sufficient as well. And then, as mentioned, the hadith in this particular, in the middle of the page, that if somebody, say, for example, started eating and then and he forgot to read Bismillah. So he was eating and he uh, forgot to read Bismillah. Then if he remembers in the middle, then what he should do is that he should then say Bismillahi awwalahu wa akhidahu. And by reading that, then whatever... <coughs> Shaitan may have ate with him, uh, he will then vomit it out as mentioned in the hadith here. Now two just final points before um, again, just got to do more with eating again. That we should also make sure that when we're eating, that we're not eating in a, on a high place. Again, this is like the sunnah. So high place doesn't have to be tables. It could even be say this like bench here. So to place our cup or our bowl or our plate and then to eat from there, that is also considered to be disliked as well. And similarly, Rasulullah also said that we should not lean against something and eat. La aqul muttaqiyan has mentioned the hadith. So to lean against a wall, or like, you know, you have big people, kings, when they like lean against the throne or their, the chair and then to eat like that, then that is also considered to be makru and disliked as well. Now this then takes me on to the ruinings. Obviously, some brother will then ask, okay, can we eat on tables? Now obviously, eating on tables, it's against the sunnah. Obviously, something uh, Rasulullah sallallahu Sorry, you won't say it's against the sunnah. It's something which Rasulullah didn't do. You'll say that, yes, sunnat masaniyhe. It's not a sunnah. There's no hadith of Absalullah sitting on a table and on the chair and then eating. But if somebody did eat at the same time, we won't call that haram or we won't call that impermissible. We'll say that, okay, he's not doing something which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi did. Similar like when you sleeping on a bed, so Rasulullah didn't actually sleep on a, on a double bed or a king side bed with uh, mattresses and so on. You know, there wasn't that comfortable kind of bedding. So you'll say it's not from the sunnah, but uh, if somebody did do it, if somebody does sleep on a bed or somebody does eat on a table, then there is nothing. It's not haram, shall I say. It's not something. Uh, it's not haram. It's not makru, but it's something which is like muba, where you're not going to get any extra reward in doing that. So that is a ruling when it comes to eating on the table. And it's very important to remember that sometimes what happens, uh, some people they go a bit like over the top, you know, uh, when it comes to eating the, on the table, to the extent that if they're going to a wedding, you know, they'll make a big hoo-ha, I don't want the table here, I want to sit on the floor and eat. Or when it's like, you know, when there's like an, any non-Muslim kind of functions or gathering, uh, when non-Muslims don't know, I don't want the table, I want to sit on the floor and eat. So, you know, sometimes you need to use a bit of hikmat, you know, sometimes you're going you're to put people off in particular if there's, uh, people from other faiths, you're going to go a bit OTT in that situation. So it's not that proper haram, like, you know, it's not like committing zina or something like that if you're eating on the table. So you should some, sometimes use a bit of wisdom and hikmah. And with regards to eating uh, forks and knives and spoons, so again, as I mentioned, that food which can be cons consumed with fingers, like I said, samosas, kebabs, and kind of things, then you should use your fingers. However, there are certain foods which is going to be difficult to use fingers, such as like custard or uh, these kind of things, or cake with custard or cereal and so on. So in that situation, if somebody used spoons, 
then that is not considered to be uh, anything wrong because there are hadiths of Rasulullah using knives and then uh, like cutting the, uh, the meat into little pieces and then getting the knife and then sticking it in the meat piece and then eating it like that. There are hadiths in Sunan al Tirmidhi of that. So from this we can derive that or if someone say for example is in a rush where it could be actually something like I don't know chips you bought but I don't know you're outside somewhere you can't actually wash your hands or you can't actually wash your hands afterwards so if somebody just used a fork to like consume it on the way or if he's on a journey or suffer then to use the spoon or something or to use a knife or something like that or fork then that would be allowed as well but obviously uh, whatever that is not the case say if you are home then hatta limkan should try to follow the sunnah may Allah give us the tawfiq to